So today let's build the LED thermometer powered by solar cells, storing some energy in supercapacitors to make it run without light for several days. I plan to build it into this box, which is big, of course, to cover it with solar panels. It will get some control buttons, maybe this, maybe this. Quite oversized, but the box is going to be big because of the panels anyway. I will basically cut a window in the front here and put some dark filter and the display behind it. And some prototyping board, one here under the display and a big one here. So it will be an L-shaped layout, basically. There are some holes for screws in the box. And of course you can buy these project boxes, you don't have to have a 3D printer for this. You don't also need any Arduino. I guess I could even make it without power tools. And I also hope I can build it without any zip ties and hot melt glue, of course. I never buy zip ties because I can pick enough of them for my needs on the pavement. And of course you don't have to build this thermometer. This video can be just an inspiration. How to build any electronic device without any super special tools or custom made boards or anything. Of course instead of this I could build a bicycle with square wheels to make like thousand times more views, but what would be the point? Well, for me, the point would be making the views, but what would be the point for the viewers to watch it? Basically just to waste their time. So let's build something useful that I actually can use, not doing it just for a video. I need a thermometer measuring the outdoor temperature and running without any power supply. And I can put it on some prototyping board. You can buy quite a lot of different prototyping boards. Some of them actually look like a breadboard with soldering stripes in groups of five and some power supply stripes. Some fragments of something I already cut, or these with continuous stripes, which you cut where you need. More of these. This one is again the breadboard style prototyping board. And there are also boards with just these circular or square spots. Not sure, are you supposed to connect them using a blob of solder, or are you meant to run a wire on it to make connections? I don't know. This one. These ones, there is a lot of these available. And of course they also come in many different qualities. This one is super thin and flimsy. And this one as well. And they're from eBay and of course they looked much better in the picture. And these are weird. There is some defect in this one and a very similar one in this one. Also the regularity of the holes is just absolutely crazy. And just look at it. This is unbelievable. Look how regularly the holes are drilled. A lot of defects here. Are the adjacent traces? Well, they are actually shorted. Nice. There is a short circuit between the two stripes on this Chinese board. So I decided to buy some better ones locally. These ones. These ones, they are thinned. These ones are striped and one in a breadboard style again, but in a better quality. They're about five times as expensive, but when you commit investing your time into manually filling this thing with components, which can take several hours, you're not going to waste your time with something like this. When you go to put that much effort into something, use quality materials. Remember that your time is the most valuable thing you have and so use it wisely, don't waste it. And that's also why I started using these precision sockets instead of these rubbish ones for my microcontrollers or chips. This is barely 10 cents, this is about one dollar, but nothing compared to your time spent replacing a bad socket. And of course there are two ways of going about the box installation. I can screw it into this and put this one over it. Or I can screw it into this side of the board and put this flat cover over it and flip it like this. So it's slightly slanted, so it only makes sense for the narrower part to be facing up and the screws in the box facing down, of course. So if the board is screwed onto this, then I need wires going from this to the buttons and the solar panels on this side, whereas if I install the panels here and then I put this one here, everything is on this side and this one is not hanging on any wires that would break, of course, very soon. I can just screw it on it, flip it and that's it. Both options are possible, but I will probably Use the upside down approach. The only downside is that I have to install the panels first and pull the wires through and then screw the board here. The most likely solution is there is going to be a board about this size screwed onto these four posts and there will be a space left for these big buttons sticking in. 
It's also possible to use these small buttons and just cut a rectangular hole in this edge and glue them in like this. I already did it in this one. This is more like a laboratory thermometer with a probe on a cable. This one will also have a cable with a probe going outside measuring the outdoor temperature. This will be an outdoor thermometer. This will be more like a portable or a laboratory one. This is up to 150 degrees. This one will be up to 99 degrees Celsius. Enough for indoor or outdoor, of course. A bit narrower range might make the measurement a bit more precise. And I have been testing this idea in a breadboard already for a couple months and it seems to work. And lowering the top of the range to 99 degrees Celsius allows me to use a lower voltage reference, which in turn allows for a lower operating voltage. The full charging voltage of the supercapacitors is 2.5 volts, they are rated 2.8 volts, so there is a headroom. And now with 1.5 volt voltage reference it can work down to 1.6 volts, even though of course then it's so dim it can only be seen in the dark. Yes, a red display can be red in the dark down to 1.6 volts, but for practical use it works down to about 1.8 or 1.9 volts. And with fully charged capacitors this draws about 4 or 5 milliamps at full brightness. Here's a brightness control and a minimum and maximum memory. And I plan to use several of these capacitors, maybe 8, 9, and these can run it for multiple days. I'm using the most efficient red display I was able to find. Of course a pure green display would be even more efficient, but it would require two such capacitors in a series or two groups in a series, whereas a red one can run on just one or all in a parallel, and it makes it simpler. And also a red display is better readable from distance, and if it's in a room where somebody sleeps, it doesn't disturb the sleep as much as a green display does. And of course later in the video I will show the schematic or put a link in the description to my website with the schematic and description. Let's cut the board. So the board is cut and it fits. It's still probably a bit oversized for the amount of components it will probably have. And I might actually cut a little bit of the board here to make space for the oversized buttons, because oversized is always better. As long as it's not a human or a car compensating for something undersized. It doesn't have to be a body part because your confidence or self-esteem is actually the important thing. And the board will basically be an L-shaped layout like this with the display here. There is a socket for the microcontroller. If you don't have the right size of the socket you can still improvise using this, for example. Still better than the right sized Chinese socket. And I might actually also put the display in a socket because the pinout of these displays is sort of standard. I have a red, orange, yellow and green and the pinout is the same. If I put it in a socket I can change it or I can change the color if I need. And in this one I don't have to cut the traces. They're already pre-cut in a breadboard style. You can just reduce the size of it, screw it on some L-shaped holders and just run wires from here to here. And I will probably put the schematic of it on my website and put a link in the description to it because if I put the schematic in the video and I ever had to correct some mistake in it, it's impossible. This is one of the annoying things about YouTube, whereas on the website I can correct everything if there is a mistake. Of course I typically triple check everything before publishing the video, but still everybody can make a mistake. But of course videos with most mistakes and nonsenses in them make the most views anyway. Let's see if I can do it without power tools. I just need my third hand here. Maybe vertical is better. Nice. Not sure how to make a window without a power tool, but at least this one doesn't contain a lithium-ion battery. A professional precision machining, of course. And believe it or not, ladies are using these sandpaper things to sandpaper their feet. But it might have a better use, especially when you remove these edges. And this after a slight modification. Of course scissors for the burying. And the window doesn't actually look that bad for using just trash tools, trash techniques and not measuring anything, just eyeballing it. 
and a slightly dark plexiglass window. It friction fits here nicely, I almost wouldn't have to glue it actually. Now it's horribly glued in and there is definitely a better glue for this and using less of it is also probably better. Now how do you join a board at a right angle? You can use some pieces of metal with two holes and bend them at a right angle. Or you can use some plastic blocks with holes. This one already has a hole here and I can drill another hole from here and that's it. And this is actually a couple of degree away from a right angle but I can sandpaper it a bit. And of course I keep every screw and a nut and a washer from everything I've disassembled in the last 20 or 30 years. Plus some metal and plastic bits, the simpler the better. Because the simpler the shape, the more likely it is to be reused. Now it's starting to get some shape. Let's just split it here to put two rows of pins into it. It will be in a socket. Three connections go to the display from this side of the chip and nine connections from this side of the chip, so it makes sense to have this side of the chip closer to the display terminals. Marking it on the board. The sockets soldered in, populating it with resistors and capacitors. The connection is to the display, horribly botched. I populated the voltage reference, or actually a voltage regulator, but used as a reference because it draws less than shunt references. And here's the display. It keeps showing random numbers because the input is not connected, but the display seems to be connected right. Planning the interconnections of the capacitors and their safety resistors. I definitely shouldn't connect anything wrong here. And the capacitors are in place and their safety resistors. And the TL431, the diode for the solar cell. Some tantalum capacitor current limiting resistor. A voltage divider for the solar panel voltage sensing. Starting to remind what it's meant to look like. Just random numbers because there is no sensor connected. And the diameter of this button is... 11.6 or 7, so I need a 12 millimeter drill bit for this. Of course no lithium ion batteries here. And every professional machinist is probably catching a heart attack. I should probably pre-drill it with a smaller bit, but... It's even a similar height. Soldering the wires to the buttons and these buttons can even be disassembled and the contacts cleaned or transplanted from other button. Imagine that. Nice. Now the buttons are connected and also tied to the board using these green wires so they don't fall off so easily. I'm about to give it a probe and the voltage of the probe and the reference is switched. When you turn it off into standby, there is no voltage. I like to use these as temperature sensors. I need a three wire cable, this one has four, so I can double the zero volt rail. And the probe is just trying the Wim Hof method and I guess I can call it close enough. Of course upside down. No different sensor from the bag is taking an ice bath and this one is reading a little bit lower, but also very close. Note that you need a 0.1 degree accuracy to measure the outdoor temperature just to know what clothes to wear. 
If you have a bag of the sensors, you will probably find out that the readings are some sort of a normal distribution curve. This one seems to be the most off out of 22 I tested. And this one is the most off, but the other direction. The worst two are plus 0.7 and minus 0.7 degrees Celsius. The other 20 are much closer to zero. So that's the probes tested in an ice bath. If there's both water and ice, the temperature will settle at zero degrees Celsius. And the display isn't as dim as it might look in the videos, because I'm using about 700 watts of fluorescent tubes and LEDs for the video. And I was initially thinking the supercapacitors will have too much of self-discharge for this, but it was the initial self-discharge before forming them. When I knew they would discharge to almost too low voltage for this in about 12 hours, but I just tried it and left it running for a couple months and now they could keep a charge for maybe a month, which is enough for this application. Now the equivalent self-discharge current would be about 100 microamps for the entire bank of 8, and this is at least an order of magnitude less than the consumption of the device. We can do a simulation using my calculator. 480 farads discharged in 39 hours from this voltage to this voltage and so the equivalent self-discharge is 98 microamps and it's actually getting even lower for longer discharge periods. And I decided to use 47 ohm resistors for each of the capacitors in series to limit the current if something shorts and the voltage is 2.5 volts maximum. This limits the current to 53 milliamps per capacitor. And the worst case dissipation is 132 milliwatts per resistor, which is about half of the rating, 250 milliwatts for the resistors. And if something short, the total current is limited to about 400 milliamps. We can also do a calculation what would be an equivalent milliamp hour capacity of a battery. This is the initial voltage and the display is sort of readable down to let's say 1.9 volts. And I set one hour here and the equivalent battery would be 80 milliamp hours then. And what about the energy in the capacitors? It comes out as 1.5 kilojoules. Let's switch it to watt hours and it comes out as about 400 milliwatt hours. But of course don't forget, this is the total energy in the capacitor that you release by discharging it to zero. But because the device doesn't work down to zero volts, only down to, let's say, 1.9 volts, it's actually able to use 176 milliwatt hours. And at night it reduces its consumption from about 4 milliamps to about 1.2 milliamps, because it switches to a lower brightness and during 16 hours with no light, the capacitors are going to discharge to 2.35 volts. So there is still enough headroom. If it's discharged to the minimum voltage where the display is still readable reasonably, it would actually take 66 hours. 66 hours without light seems to be enough room. But of course as the voltage declines the current goes down, so in reality it would last longer, but it would be progressively dimmer. Or like a resistive discharging curve. The brightness would decline on this sort of curve. And of course because of the safety resistors in a series with each capacitor, if one of them shorts, it doesn't short the other ones. And if the load shorts, it limits the current and just safely discharges the capacitors without any connections or wires glowing orange and setting the building on fire. And I've made this sensor testing socket out of a fragment of a chip socket. And I should also mention that the self-discharge of these capacitors improves very significantly after keeping them charged for a couple of weeks, whereas the self-discharge of this capacitor from eBay does not improve at all. Here's the 1.5 volt voltage reference. Let's make a more permanent probe. I'm using a flat cable which can go through a window. And of course, even if the cable got crushed and shorted, it's not going to damage the device because the power to this goes via a resistor. And because the sensor draws just about 5 microamps, in a normal operation this resistor drops about nothing, several millivolts, but in case of a short, it would limit the current. And of course the resistance of this cable has to be an absolute disaster, but we are talking about 5 microamps plus the negative is going to be doubled. I'm preparing heat shrinks on the wires and going to solder it on this. And this is probably the trickiest part of the whole thermometer construction, not actually the entire board circuitry. This part is going to be exposed to the elements for many years.
And the most important bit is, of course, don't forget to prepare the heat shrinks. And the one from the outside to make it waterproof, of course. I basically flood it with super glue from both sides and then I heat shrink it. Maybe two or three layers for reliability and this time I want to try white as the outer one, so it's not skewed as much by sun. And this should be it. Of course the cable has to go in somewhere. I connected the cable in, soldered it here and it's working. I've made the probe for this thermometer about 10 years ago and after 10 years in the elements it's still working well. So I'm not showing you something that I have just invented a couple minutes ago and that's going to fall apart in a couple days. And this probe construction seems to be proven by time. Looking for some suitable screws to screw the board into the box. And the four screws are in and of course these are self-tapping screws and when I'm putting it back for the second time you insert it carefully, turn it counterclockwise until it clicks and then put it back. Instead of shredding the plastic tunnel by cutting a new thread into it in a different position than the previous one. Now it's temporarily horribly botched together, but finally all four panels will be the same. Probably this type 95 by 48 millimeters and 11 cells in series in it. But I'm still waiting for them. And these temporary panels are just sticky taped on it. For the final ones I have to find a better solution. But most importantly it works. And of course for indoor light you're using almost double the number of cells in a series for the voltage and way more surface area. But it already seems to work nicely. Here is the brightness control, the minimum and maximum memory, resetting the minimum and maximum memory, a long press here can turn it off, this one back on, and it has four screws here and the top basically becomes the bottom of it, and it's basically finished other than that I have to wait for four identical panels for it. And I of course have to draw the schematic and put it on my website together with the program. The schematic is going to be simple and similar to the previous thermometer, but it has super capacitors instead of nickel metal hydride batteries and the solar panel, which goes in via this current limiting resistor. It's meant for indoor light, but this resistor limits the current if it's ever exposed to direct sunlight. Not to bake the hell out of the TL431 regulator here. There is a resistive divider sensing the solar panel voltage to be able to dim the display at night. And via a shotkey diode it goes into the capacitors, all in parallel, but each of them has a series resistor. And there's a tantalum capacitor, couple ceramic capacitors on the supply rails, and the voltage reference rail. And the voltage reference in my DIY adapter because it only comes in an SMD package. And the microcontroller, and the four resistors for the display, just four because it's multiplexing by the same segments, not digits. In eight steps, all the segments A, all the segments B, all the way to the decimal point, and the display the buttons and that's it. And the TL431 regulators are a bit tricky. I was measuring how much they draw at 2.4 volts, basically just below the maximum charging voltage. And some of them draw 40 microamps and some of them as much as 400 microamps at 2.4 volts. And the data sheet doesn't really say much about this. I just compared several versions and chose the one which draws the least current. And of course this video is getting bloody long and also bloody laborious to make. But if you've made it that far, please consider supporting this channel on Patreon using the thanks button or subscribing. And big thanks to all of you who already support me.